pleasure to be here. This is the second year that I've been a, a organizer here, so it's glad to see this thing rolling. I'm here from the San Diego chapter. Um, so today we're going to be talking a little bit about uh, cloud uh, virtual networking and how to use virtual networking to solve some application security um, issues. So my name is uh, John Studeris. Like I said, I'm from the San Diego chapter. Um, I'm uh, independent. I do uh, product management, mainly in the cloud and security space. I also do uh, independent uh, security risk assessments in pharmaceutical aviation, uh, finance, those type of fields. Okay, so um, quick uh, agenda. So what are we going to cover today? Uh, we're going to talk about uh, cloud cybersecurity. Why is it so difficult and what, what can we do to make it a little bit easier? Uh, what's a virtualized security function? We're going to talk about that and what exactly we can uh, virtualize. Uh, we're going to do a little bit of a primer for those of you that aren't aware of uh, what an SDN is, Software Defined Networking. Um, I know mo most of you come from the application space. So we're going to dive down a little bit into the cloud networking space and what it's all about and how we can leverage it to do some interesting things. Uh, all of this is based upon a lab that I put together. Um, I've given this a couple of times at uh, some other security uh, conferences and cloud conferences as well. So the whole thing is in, in GitHub. Everything from Terraform scripts to actually start up uh, physical machines, do the full cloud installation, spin up the virtual network security functions, uh, and set it all up so you can actually deploy some uh, security chains to deploy um, a web app, uh, to secure web application. So if you're interested in doing that, click on there. Um, the GitHub has everything you need on it. Uh, there's a code on there. You can use the code to get some free cloud resources to actually spin it all up. OK, so a quick uh, background. So this work here is based upon a true story. Um, about five, six years ago, I was doing some consulting work for a telco um, who ran a managed security service. They ran a you know basic SOC that uh, they were running uh, firewalls, managed firewalls, you know web application firewalls. They were securing it all basically in the physical world, and they wanted to move into the virtual world. They wanted to start securing uh, web applications that are running in third-party clouds. So the telco themselves, they didn't have a cloud but they realized their customers were moving from the physical space into cloud spaces. So they're moving into Amazon, Azure, and a couple of other um, cloud offerings. So they're trying to figure out, how can we take our stock offering? How can we take the people and expertise we have there and use that to protect these um, uh, operations that are moving into the cloud environment? So at the time, uh, Amazon and Azure were the two big um, you know, closed cloud offerings. Uh, Cisco had a product. Anyone here from Cisco that, or anyone remember the meta cloud project that Cisco did? So this was Cisco going out to data center companies, uh, data center providers, and actually setting up OpenStack private clouds that, um, that spanned multiple data center providers. And then also some um, HP was doing the same thing. Uh, and then also private data center companies that are setting up their own uh, virtual clouds. Uh, so you can get your own private cloud environment. Um, and Mirantis was doing the same thing as well. So the things we were running into is well, security is labor intensive. It's difficult to go and get enough people you need to, to monitor all these environments. Deployment was taking weeks. So you get a customer on board. Uh, even though you're no longer dealing with physical equipment, you still it just takes weeks to go through and configure all the devices. Um, manual configurations of devices just wasn't being done correctly, uh, lots of errors in the uh, configurations being put together, and basically how to, how to automate it all. So we're going to walk through this. We're going to walk through what we put together. Um, since then, the technology has become a lot more, there's a lot more interesting technology in the cloud space that can be used. So I've updated this. And even though I'm, the project doesn't exist anymore and I'm not involved with it, I've still kept it alive. Uh, that's part of me putting it up on GitHub there and taking some of the newer technologies and, and running with it. OK, so quick background. What is a virtual network function? So if those of you in telco space, uh, you're probably familiar with um, uh, virtual uh, taking um, network functions and virtualizing them. So we're taking something that used to be an appliance. It used to be some sort of a physical box. And we're taking it and we're either putting it into the cloud management layer or putting it into a VM uh, and making it available within the cloud environment. So virtual machine, so whether an Amazon AMI or uh, OpenStack, QK, whatever environment running. So 
we, here we see a lot of traditional stuff, but it applies to security as well. You can take a web application firewall. You can take an intelligent firewall. You can take a database firewall. You can take an IDS and IPS. Uh, you can take all of these things. You can take anti-DDoS, and you can put them into VM components, and you can make them available inside the... Uh, um, inside cloud. So keep that in mind. We're going to get that back back to this a little bit later. Next thing is, what is service chaining? What's service chaining all about? So what service chaining is, is it defines a policy that says traffic that's destined to this host, maybe it's a uh, web server, maybe it's a database server, maybe it's an application server, must flow through these devices, through these other controls before it arrives at the final destination. So we do this a lot in layer three, right, with, with routing. We're saying, okay, any traffic that's destined to this web server has to go through a DDoS device, and we do with level three TCP IP routing. We say it has to route through this firewall, it has to route through this WAF, it has to route through this IDS, IPS, and the layer three routing takes care of it and, and uh, pushes it all through those devices. With um, virtual networking, with software-defined networking, you can do the same thing in layer two without the complexity, complexities of layer three networking. So type of things that you can put in place, you know, DPAC inspection, firewall, uh, load balancing, monitoring, um, parental controls, all sorts of things. And then on the security side, once again, we got WAF, DDoS, IDS, IPS. So we can take these things, we can build together policies, and we can implement them in layer three and, and layer two. Okay, so we got a couple of definitions in the background. So securing virtualized, so why is it so tough nowadays when you got stuff running in the cloud environment for a security team to, to stay on top of it? First thing is dynamic lifetimes. We got application teams out there, they're spinning up, they're tearing down environments. We got um, VMs that have a lifespan of days. We've got containers that have lifespans of hours. It's very difficult for a security group to stay on top of all these workloads starting up and shutting down. Um, by the time a security engineer might even be aware that there's a new environment running and to get the firewall rules changed, to get the WAF set up to, for this new in instance of it, whether it's a uh, you know, QA environment or prod environment or whatever, the environment could be gone. Right. So we, we need to start thinking in terms of how can we handle these dynamic lifetimes. Uh, configuration complexity, the security tools are getting more and more complex. So we have to go through, spend a lot more time going through configuring them, which uh, introduces errors. Uh, we have to go through change to layer three networking, which means we have, might have to change IP addresses on devices, update routing tables. Uh, once again, that's going to cause um, errors. You might have a QA environment, a production environment, might have different IP addresses which means your security tools are gonna to have different IP addresses for the different environments. You can't use the same stock templates between the two environments, uh, which is gonna cause additional time. And what you see a lot in cloud environment is people just taking the security devices and they're bolting them onto the outside of the cloud, right? So traffic that comes into the cloud goes through a firewall or a WAF, and then once it's inside the cloud environment, once it's inside the virtual environment, then it's not monitored anymore. So we want to fix that. We want to make sure that there's um, a monitoring and security inside within the VMs as it's going through. OK. So these are the things that we want to try and fix using um, cloud security. OK, so typically you walk in, you see a company that's gone. They've moved into AWS, they've moved into some sort of private cloud environment, and they've taken their layer three, their traditional uh, physical um, TCP IP networking, and they've just applied it into the, into the physical, into the virtual network. So that means they've gone through, they set up a single DMZ, right? And they've put all their web application firewalls in that DMZ. Maybe they've put their, their edge um, uh, application servers or you know, Apache servers in that D DMZ. Um, they've gone, they put the IDS environments in, that, in the DMZ as well to monitor traffic that's going through. Um, and, they, and all their workloads are sharing that same set of web application firewalls and firewalls. There's no segmentation across all the different workloads. So the first thing is, well, what, what can we do about it? What about a, what, what inside a cloud environment can we do to segment, a, segment, up, segment that out? Well, first thing we can do is we can go and we can, um, well, let's see, sorry. <clears throat> First thing we can do is we can go and we can de deploy security directly in the cloud. We move away from deploying it on the, on the edge. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take some of those workloads, we're gonna virtualize them, we're gonna deploy them inside the cloud. Uh, we're gonna go and segment out the traffic. So rather than having 
one DMZ for every single application we're running. So let's say you're running five applications and you have five uh, set of websites, one for each one. We're going to segment it out. We're going to have a web application firewall or a cluster web application firewalls that's just dedicated to that application. We're going to have another set of web application firewalls that just dedicated to application number two, another set to application number three. What does this get us? Well, this gets us when we start up and spin down environments, we know that these are the security tools that are associated with that web application. So if web application one goes away, we know that we can get rid of the security tools, which in this case would be virtual machines, because we've gone, we've taken the security tools and we've replaced them with the virtual machines. Uh, we can tear down those virtual machines. And if we're making changes to rules, we know that all of the rules all of the security rules that are associated with web application number one, whether it's Oracle Financials or it's a WordPress website, would be in the security tools for web application number, would be in, in that set of uh, WAFs. So we don't have to, it's not, we get a, away from the set of monolithic um, set of uh, rules. So one cloud that's done a great job about this is uh, Amazon. So when we started the project, Amazon didn't have this in place, but since then they've gone through and they've implemented a web application firewall inside Amazon. So this is a whole feature within Amazon. You can push a button, click, and bingo, you have a WAF protecting your website. Um, the WAF, the price, it's no changing of networking. You don't have to go through re-IP address any of your networking. It's automatically turned on. It's consumption-based pricing which means you get charged for each rule that you define in the, uh, within the WAF, and you get, you get charged by the amount of traffic and the number of rules that are hit. So you can take your WASP top 10 rules, you can implement them directly into the Amazon WAF, uh, and you get some segmentation, right? You've got the rules that are associated with application number one that you're running in Amazon, You've got another set of rules for application number two. So we've gone through and we've started segmenting out our application. We've gone through and uh, compartmentalized. The Oracle Financials is compartmentalized in one VPC with one set of Amazon uh, WAF rules, and, and our WordPress website is compartmentalized in another one. So instant on, you know, it's very seamless. But what happens if I'm not in, a, in an Amazon environment, or what happens if I'm not happy with the Amazon tool sets? What can I do? What can I, um, is there some way that I can go through and, and do this myself? Okay, so if at this point we've gone through, we've segmented out, we've used the cloud, we've set up multiple VPCs, we've set up multiple networks inside of a cloud environment. It's very easy, push a button, you turn on, you can get additional virtual networking, you can get uh, additional subnets, you can get additional layer two, layer three networks. So we've gone through, we've taken all of our workloads, we've segmented out. But now the issue is we're starting up these VMs and a security engineer now needs to go through and configure each of these VMs, the security VMs, right? Because now we've got five set, five times as many uh, security VMs. What can we do to reduce the workload on that? Okay. Well, how about if we go through and we standardize our builds of our security tools? How about if we go through and we standardize our WAF that has all of the security tools built into the VM, that has all of the configurations built into it, that it's gone through predefined, and the security group, instead of going out every time a new WAF is set up, going through and configuring it, instead they just have a set of golden images with all of the rules pre-built and ready to go. And here's the WAF with all of the rules for Oracle Financials. Here's the WAF with all of the rules that can uh, protect um, WordPress. We go through, we build them up, and we make them available, and we tell the application development team, okay, as part of your, every time you spin up, here are the security tools, and they've gone through and they're already pre-configured. Okay, so what security tools can we go through and build up into these VMs and go, go through and configure them? Well, I mean, here are all the big ones. Snort, Squid, TCP Dump, uh, Mod Security, they're all available. In the lab that I've put together, I've taken uh, PFSense, Mod Security, uh, Squid, TCP Dump, Snort. I've gone through and I've taken them and put them in and uh, into VMs, so they're all ready to go. All the networking inside the VMs ready to go. So it's very quick. Be able to go through, turn on this uh, security tool, and it's ready to go. Um, you know, it's a little bit of work, but it scales very well. Because if you go through and you build out the Snort instance and it's ready to go, and you say, okay, this is the Snort instance for this application that we run in-house, 
anytime the development team wants to spin up a development environment, a UAT environment, a QA environment, a production environment, the security tools are ready to go. And they have no excuse not to go ahead and turn them on and incorporate them and, and include them in with their regular testing process, development process, because the tools are ready to go. They don't have to get someone from the security team involved to go through. Okay. So at this point, we've built out a catalog of security products, right? So they're all uploaded in our Amazon environment. They're all uploaded in our OpenStack environment, and they're ready to go. So we've got pre-configured versions of WAF for all of the applications running. We've got golden images uh, built and ready to go. Okay, but now we've got the development team doing arbitrary roles, right? So they're running a CI CD environment. So the development team is, you know, three times a day, they're rolling out a new version of their software. Um, how can we go through and be integrated in with that? And how can we have our own CI CD um, process going within the security group? So if we find an exploit um, and we need to patch it, how can we be able to go through and roll out um, our security updates as well? We don't want it, we're trying to get away from going into the VM and patching the VM and instead, building a new golden image that has a control to handle the new exploit built into the golden image and then push out that golden image across all of the workloads that, that we're protecting. So we got a couple of things there. We need to be able to work with the development team and then we need to have our own um, internal CI CD. So, so we can work with the development team. We can start putting our own things, but a couple of things need to happen is you might need to reach back to your, um, to your vendors right? Because your vendors might not support licensing issues where um, you might want to run five times as many copies because of whatever web security tool, because you've split up your workload across five different VPCs. So my experience with this is, and I was the guy that had to go out and talk to the vendors, is the vendors are understanding. They're realizing that, hey, instead of getting one monolithic server with all the traffic for all the workloads, you are now running it through five ones, each with a smaller set of, of, um, of traffic going through. And you got to change the uh, licensing agreement. So instead of it being by instance, maybe it's by the amount of traffic that's flowing through it if you're buying your licensing in some sort of consumption-based model. Um, obviously, if you're working in an open source environment, um, you don't have those sort of things in place. But um, you don't have to worry about uh, licensing agreements. Okay. So... So now we've got this great environment. We've got all these in integration. We've got integrated with uh, CI CD. We're continuously rolling it out. Um, we're able to take the same environments and roll it out in prod QA, UAT uh, development because we've got these golden images and it, they can be uh, rolled out all the time. Security gets part of the development and testing process that the application team is is running, so um, so there are not any of these glitches that happen when things are turned on in production and security is introduced. We've got security introduced as early in the in the uh, process stream, in the development stream as as possible. Okay, but what do we do about those VMs that just get started up, aren't part of a CI/CD environment? Someone just goes logs into the cloud environment and they start up um, a virtual machine. Well, in that case, we need to be, we need to tap into the cloud. We need to get automated messaging from the cloud when someone goes, starts up a VM, and that VM has access to the internet. We need to go and say, okay, as soon as any type of VM starts up that has port 80 or 443 access, inbound access from the internet, we need to automatically turn on a web application firewall and an IDS IPS in front of it. And the clouds will give you, they will give you that type of notification. So um, you put in the workflows so that get the VM gets turned on, security immediately gets turned on. So that's part of working with the, C with the SDN environment. And we'll talk, that, talk about that in a little bit. So it's a combination of one, detecting that a VM gets started up, and then also classifying the VM. What networks is that VM connected to? Is it connected to the internet? Is it connected to your PCI network? In which case that's gonna drive um, what type of uh, security devices need to get turned on. Um, and those, those security devices will be done using uh, service chaining, which we'll talk about in a second. Okay. 
Um, so we've talked about uh, spinning everything up. We've talked about monitoring, looking for things. Um, let's see, we've talked about automatically turning on the WAFs based upon what the SDN tells us that the network's doing. Um, but the question is, every time um, a network device gets turned on, we don't want to go through and have to change the IP addressing on it just to s satisfy putting a security tool in place. Uh, traditionally, if you're doing uh, TCP IP networking at layer three and you want to put a web application firewall in front of um, something, you might have to go through and change the routing. You might have to change IP addresses on, on devices. So we, want, we don't want to do that. Is there some way within uh, using the SDN environment, using the cloud environment, the virtual networking, that we don't have to change the networking? And there is. We do, what we use is we use layer two service, um, we do layer two service chaining um, and we do service injection at layer two, which basically means we create a service chain, um, much like you'd create a service chain in layer three that says all traffic for this web application firewall has to go through these IP addresses. But instead of using IP addresses, we're using layer two constructs or we're using ports on at layer two. So we'll, we'll get into a couple of examples of that. But the benefits, why would we do something in, in layer two instead of layer three? Well, the big thing is that there's no change to the application. The application doesn't notice when you go through and you change the security products that are in front of, the, in front of that application. If it's at layer three, there's going to be some IP address changing. Uh, the OS is going to, they're going to notice that uh, these changes happen. If you do it in layer two, we can swap in and out security products. We can be running one WAF one day. We decide we don't like it. We could swap in another WAF. Um, no changing to the IP addressing. It's totally transparent to it all. Uh, you know, other benefits, you get some lower latency, um, you get some better automation. Um, it's not visible to layer three. So if you're doing a trace route, you're not going to see these security devices that are, um, that have been introduced. Um, but it does introduce complexity in that you are going to have to have a virtual network that is smart enough to be able to do um, uh, layer two uh, service chaining support. Okay, so let's get into uh, some little more technical details about how we go through and do some of this layer two stuff. Uh, anyone here familiar with OpenStack? So what OpenStack's all about? Okay, so OpenStack, uh, Neutron is the software-defined networking component that's built into OpenStack. It's actually an API, it's a definition of uh, what of the automation that can be done in the software-defined networking network. Uh, there are various implementations, different vendors and different open source providers have their own implementations of, um, of Neutron. So you can, you can use some of the stock open source ones and there are a number of different open source ones uh, or you can use a, a vendor supplied one. But since they all satisfy and they all comply with the same API interface, they can all be swapped in and out interchangeably. So any tools, any of the service chain uh, command line interfaces that we're talking about, they will all work with Neutron uh, compliance um, SDNs. So some of the commands that you're going to see here, you know, if you're using MitreNet or uh, Dragonflow or VN, uh, if you go through and, and replace it with a different flavor, um, the, the tools will continue um, working. So under these, uh, underneath, oftentimes you'll see um, Open vSwitch, uh, Linux Bridge. Those will be the underlying uh, sort of layer two networking that exists, and um, the S the SDN at the will work at the layer three level. Um, typical. Root, typical uh, things that you do in SDN would be, you know, create a network, create a subnet, uh, create ports, um, define what the routing is. Okay, so let's take a look at our first service chain here. So the service chain, you can think of a traffic flow as traffic flowing um, from left to right. So we got traffic source. So in this case, that could be a web client. And then we've got traffic destination, which would be a web server on the right-hand side. So we got traffic flowing from left to right here. Um, along the way, we're going to have multiple controls that we want to have put in place. So we might have a WAF, we might have an IDS, uh, we might have an anti-DDoS system. And you know, we're running this in production, so we want to have multiple implementations of it, right? So we might, might want to have 
two or three WAFs, um, you know, a couple of uh, DDoS machines. In this case, there are you know virtual machines, but this could work with physical machines as well. Um, so we have individual machines, uh, and then they're, they're replicated as well. So the two machines work in um, uh, work in pair. So either one of them can go down uh, and keep th keep things running. So as we we got left to right here. So the traffic source it has to go through service service one. So maybe that's um, anti DDoS. So the anti DDoS we have two VMs running. So service one VM one, service one VM two. Both of those are identical virtual machines running our anti DDoS software that we've gone through from our golden image and started them up. Um, each of those machines has two ports, an ingress port and an egress port. So traffic goes in on the egress port on the left, goes through the anti DDoS, DDoS implementation, and then it leaves on the right port for the, the egress port. So the VM needs to have two virtual interfaces on it. Typically, we also define a third interface on it, a service port. And so that is so you can SSH into the, into the VM to do management, check up on it. So that third port isn't uh, indicated here. We'll see it in a little bit. Um, so traffic will go through. It'll be load balanced. The SDN is going to load balance the traffic across those that first service, maybe anti-DDoS. Then we go into the second service, and maybe the second service is a web application firewall. In this case, we have four VMs, all identical, running as a web application firewall. Load balance across all four of them. Once again, it's going. traffic is flowing in to the ingress port on the left, and then it's leaving on the egress port on the right. It go, once again, the SDN takes a look at the traffic and then sends it through our third uh, service function. So that might be the IDS. So maybe we're running Snort. Um, it's, it's monitoring and logging the traffic. So we're running three VMs in that case. Once again, ingress on the left and egress on the right. So you got these tuples of ingress and egress. Um, and then you've got these uh, sets of multiple VMs that make up a service function. So the set of the multiple service function is we're going to call a group. And then the ingress and egress ports that make up a single VM, we call a port pair. So that's sort of the standard te techno uh, um, term standard terminology. So across the way, this is a, so this is a service chain and this is the whole service flow. Okay, so how do we go through? and actually implement one of these. So here's the command line interface to go through and actually create uh, a service chain. First thing we need to do is we need to define what type of traffic do we want to have to go through this chain. So this is our policy. So in this case, we're going to say any traffic, source IP prefix, any traffic that's originating from this IP, maybe it's a block of uh, IP addresses, that's destined for this a following IP, so maybe that's the web server. So that, that goes back, right? So in that case, that'd be our web server all the way on the far right, and the origination is the traffic source, the web client all the way on the left. So we're saying anything traffic from the source to the destination that's running TCP port 80, um, we are going to have to, that's the flow classifier, so that we're saying that is the type of traffic we want to enforce. We want to require to go through the service chain. So traffic, in this case, traffic to port 443 would not go through the service chain. It would immediately go to the destination and the, um, uh, the SDN would not push the traffic through. And at the bottom here w is how we go through and we define the port pairs, we define the port pair groups and the full chain. So a port pair, remember we talked, that's an ingress and an egress. So it's the two ports on a VM. So that creates that port pair is a single VM, ingress and egress port, ports being layer two constructs as opposed to layer three IP addresses. Uh, the port pair group is the multiple VMs that we have in redundant configuration working together. So maybe we have three VMs. Each VM is a port pair. We group them all together in a port pair group, right? And then the chain, we are taking the flow classifier that we defined above that says any traffic destined for port 80 on the web server. And we are applying it and saying it has to go through that port pair group. So this is a very simple example. In this example, we have a single virtual machine with an ingress and egress, ingress and egress ports. And then it's just going through a, um, a single, single virtual machine that's uh, making up our port pair and our, port and our full chain. 
okay? So in this implementation here on the right, uh, on that uh, picture there, we've got the web server, the web client, and then the, the Netmon, which is a uh, golden image machine that I have that has Snort on it, that has the web application for all the tools built into it. And once again, you see three IP addresses on it, right? An ingress, an egress, and then a service interface on it. So that's why it's got three ports. So what does it look like inside the virtual machine? You know, so we've gone through, we've taken Snort, we've taken a WAF, we've taken all of the tools, we've put them inside. So you have to do a little bit of networking inside of it. Um, two different ways to do it. You can tell the kernel inside your virtual machine to go through and traffic that comes in on ports, the ingress port. You can say, go ahead and push it through on the egress port. So that's done with just typical IPv4 forwarding. So it sees the traffic, it comes in and automatically sends it through. And then you just take your passive tools and you have them sit there and monitor the traffic as it comes in into the, into the ingress ports. It can watch it there. Or if you're doing something active, like an intrusion detection system where you actually want the VM to drop the traffic, then the, the, um, that software needs to be in line reading traffic from the ingress port, looking at it, and then pushing it out on the egress port as it so desires. In that case, you'll want to make sure to turn off kernel forwarding because otherwise it'll defeat the um, Snort um, I IDS that's running there. Okay. So for those of you that are want to be adventurous, uh, this is going through and actually starting up the lab. Um, you know, I've, I hold sessions where it's, you know, three hours and we go through and we do all the exercises. And the exercises consist of spinning up some uh, the virtual machines with all the security controls in place, um, setting up the... Uh, uh, um, setting up the chains. Uh, we have a couple of um, uh, websites that you then go through and put security tools in place. And then we start to do the opposite where we start up a couple of black boxes that are VMs where you don't know what it's doing. And those VMs are actually sending traffic out to sort of simulate them being malicious. And you have to go through and you have to put the security controls in place of those ones. So all of that, those there are about four labs uh, that make up the, um, the workshop. But um, interesting enough, when you start this up, the lab, you use a physical machine that's provided um, and then the full network and you actually sets up a private cloud inside where you start up all of the, um, the virtual machines. So if we take a look at what's inside of the lab when it gets started up, here are all the golden images. These are basically, uh, the, the Netmon is that golden image that has all the security tools inside of it, you know, IDS, Snort, um, everything else. PFSense is open source firewall. Uh, the IoT, that's a malicious IoT device that spews out traffic that we use the Netmon system to monitor and, and block the traffic on. Uh, the Cirrus web is, we use that to simulate a web server and, uh, and a web client. So when we go through and you start up the, the lab, what does it look like from sort of a layer three environment? So the right side, is this is what it looks like from a layer three. On the, the diagram on the right, if you take a look at the left, you see the web client and the web server. And we've set up a chain that monitors traffic that's moving from the web client to the web server. However, the Netmon machines, which are our virtual security functions, um, are set up on a separate network, separate layer three network. So they have separate TCP IP addressing. So if you look at it from a layer three perspective, you don't actually see the devices connected on. But at layer two, they are monitoring and the SDN is pushing the traffic through those devices. And those Netmon machines, they're connected to a management interface, which is used to connect in and manage the, the virtual machines. And they're connected onto a service uh, network, which is those interfaces that are used by the um, uh, by the SDN to push traffic in and out of. So, so in this case, we have um, two network monitoring machines running web client and web server, and we set up a chain where traffic has to go through um, the Netmon 1 and the Netmon 2 before it's delivered to the web server. And that's where we go through and we imp actually implement our security controls. 
So moving forward, what are we doing with this lab? What, what are we adding in? Um, so you sort of seen the, the web application. We want to be able to do the same thing and create additional chains, but for databases. So between the web application server and the database server, put in rules, put in uh, service chains, put in whatever, create whatever virtual security functions are required to monitor sort of the SQL traffic between the two. <coughs> um, we want to be able to, we want to, uh, enhance the uh, network service function chaining. That's the command line you're doing uh, to uh, enable load balancing support um, and then have better, uh, some better flow classification filters. So when you go through and you set up the, to find what traffic um, flows through, um, have better rules to set that up. And the other thing is to really automate this, we need to have a API support, right? You can't go through and you can't be writing command lines. We want to be able to have it so it's automatically tied in APIs are called to automatically spin up the v VMs, automatically set up the security chains when the um, uh, you know when the workloads are are started up. So we're running all of this right now in virtual machines, but there's nothing to say we can't run this in, con in containers. So you know that's one of the directions we're taking a look at is moving away from from VMs into containers. They can start up faster use uh, less resources. Uh, if the workloads are going to be running in containers, we need the security tools to run in, in containers as well. Okay, uh, a couple of takeaways because I'm keeping you from lunch. Um, so security needs to leverage cloud technologies, right? Everyone else is moving forward. There's no reason why the security teams um, you know, shouldn't be using um, SDNs and, and all the rest of the the technology that the cloud brings with it. Um, don't fall behind on automation, right? If everything's being rolled out in CI CD, you should probably have your own, you know, golden images that you can provide into the CI CD um, uh, deployment mechanisms. Uh, push your um, security vendors uh, for cloud support, right? If they're not selling you their product in a way that you can use in the cloud, if they're still selling you physical devices that you need to bolt onto the outside, you need to talk to them and find out if they're going to have support that, for instances, that you can run inside the cloud and that'll allow you to segment your traffic out. So rather than running one monolithic environment, you're running a lot of smaller ones of the security product, one for each um, of your application that you're running. Um, be aware of security login. You know, I think AWS is great, but uh, they rolled out their web application firewall and then all of the other web application firewalls, third-party vendors that were selling within the Amazon, you know, sort of got locked out, right? Who's going to buy a third-party? AWS or Azure don't offer any of the layer 2. There's no bump in the wire. There's no bump in the two service. I mean, literally, this works only if you're running OpenStack or running your own private cloud and you can implement something where you can take a bump in the wire. The layer 2 stuff, yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, in the AWS marketplace, there are layer 3 WAFs that you can, you can buy there, too. But I think their market has been considerably gone away since AWS came out with their own layer three WAF. So I, I can't speak if, if the AWS WAF is a layer two or layer three. It's sort of hidden. Um, and the other thing to keep in mind is you need to figure out how your security group is gonna scale, right? If you're scaling by every new client that comes on, if you're a SOC and you have to support multiple clients and you each client is a one-off, uh, you're not going to be able to scale very well. You need to start taking a look at, can we provide standardized images that we can go through and roll out? So each customer that's running Oracle Financial is great. We've got a package of all the security products that are needed. And then you just update that on a monthly basis or as, as needed. And then you can roll out your customers rather than treating each customer as, as its own and patching one independently. It makes more sense to patch the golden image and then roll that golden image out across all of the environments that are um, th uh, th that are running that workload. So, any questions? I know it's a lot of information. Nope. So, just out of curiosity, um, you know, is, is anyone taking a look at uh, deploying security in, in layer two? So, I know one person mentioned you know doing bump on the wire stuff, or is everyone pretty much in, in layer three? It's a, it's a little bit of a fundamental different way of, of thinking about things. So so I'll be around if anyone's got any questions. I'm happy to talk more about it or if you're interested in, in running lab yourself. By all means, I'm happy to help out. Thanks. Mm -hmm.